Item number SCP-4939. Object class safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-4939 is self-containing within its own documentation file. Description. SCP-4939 is an anonymous error within the Foundation database attached to the statement listed below. Upon clicking an individual word in the statement below, the subject will be redirected to a series of Foundation documents, the majority of which seemingly belong to an alternate timeline. For example, documentation of undiscovered anomalies. SCP-4939 a star-like dance. Item number SCP-8999 Object Class Sympatico Note Item is unpredictable but not dangerous. Special Containment Procedures SCP-8999 is to be housed in Standard Animalia Kingdom Class Containment Unit in Lunar Site 4. SCP-8999 is to be fed two 16-ounce proportions of dry dog food daily. SCP-8999 is to wear a muscle at all times, unless approved for testing or feeding. To access SCP-8999, permission from personnel of Lunar Staff Level 4 Security Clearance or higher is required. Following August 9th, 1983, SCP-8999 has been assigned a primary caretaker for maximum psychological health, that being Dr. Axel Rivas. Description SCP-8999 is a canine specimen derived from the Siberian Husky. Before gaining its anomalous properties, SCP-8999 was raised as part of the Foundation's program training animals to thrive in space, lunar animals for testing. SCP-8999, previously known as Lucy, was the fittest for space travel at the time the next flight was planned. SCP-8999, previously known as Lucy, was the fittest for space travel at the time the next flight was planned. SCP-8999 gained its anomalous properties upon drinking water from the Nix River in the Cabus Crater near the South Pole of the Moon. Within minutes of drinking the water, SCP-8999 became unaffected by the reduced level of gravity. Additionally, SCP-8999 gained the ability to naturally survive without oxygen. Most notably, SCP-8999 has developed a series of bark and quadrupedal movement combinations which result in automatic shifts of the current lunar phase. Addendum Combination Input Moon Phase Output the following is a comprehensive list of SCP-8999's discovered bark and quadrupedal movement combinations, which result in automatic shifts of the Earth's Moon's current lunar phase. Bark type Quadrupedal movement Lunar phase Three loud barks Two steps forward Third quarter shifts to waxing crescent A low whimper Two steps backwards. Waxing gibbous shifts to first quarter. A growl when step forward. First quarter shifts to waxing gibbous. A yelp. Three steps backwards. Banging gibbous shifts to new. No sounds were made. One full spin followed by sitting down. First quarter shifts to first quarter. A howl. Three steps forwards. Four shifts to third quarter. Two winds, two steps backwards. First quarter shifts to waxing gibbous. Addendum, satellite incident. On August 21st, 1983, a NASA satellite captured an image of Dr. Rivas taking SCP-8999 for testing on a dorsal bay of the moon. Dr. Rivas can survive the moon's exosphere without any protective gear, thus was not wearing any. This image was secured by the Pentagon and transferred to the Foundation without incident. Any NASA officials who saw the image were amnesticized. Dr. Rivers had been ordered to wear non-functional protection gear when straying from any of the lunar sites to prevent an incident of this caliber from happening again. 
Dr. Reavers expressed high levels of stress the following week of the incident, permanently remaining within the non-oxygen-equipped rooms of Lunar Site-19, and requested a week break from his work with SCP-8999. Item number SCP-7077 Object Class Safe SCP-7077 is currently undergoing neutralization. Special Containment Procedures SCP-7077 is to be monitored via the Foundation's The Inventor. Monthly checks are to be carried out until SCP-7077 has dissipated entirely and permanently, confirming SCP-7077's neutralization. SCP-7077 is to be kept in a standard humanoid containment chamber within Lunar Site 10. SCP-7077-1's diet primarily consists of a beverage comprised of dark matter and ammonia ice. Description SCP-7077 is a hexagonal cloud on the south pole Note, the South Pole of Saturn did not spot a hexagonal cloud before the discovery of SCP-7077. The Voyager had only discovered a hexagonal cloud upon the northern pole of Saturn. SCP-7077 was discovered by NASA's probe, the Rebus, on the 3rd of June, 1985. The Foundation took notice of SCP-7077 when reports were released stating the fluctuation of SCP-7077's appearance. Foundation agents posed as NASA officers and secured the rights to Saturn's Southern Hexagon mission. Testing has discovered that SCP-7077 is composed of ammonia ice. Note, makes up Saturn's hexagon and dark matter. The source of the substance was discovered within the Inventor mission. The Foundation sent the Inventor to observe SCP-7077 on the 18th of July, 1985. Thermal imaging displayed a humanoid figure within SCP-7077. Further exploration revealed a sapient humanoid designated as SCP-7077-1 sharing genetic and physical similarities with the Cervidae. Or dear. After this discovery, the Foundation attempted a communication with SCP-7077-1 via the space probe The Inventor. SCP-7077-1 agreed to meet with the Foundation on the Earth's moon to ease communication efforts. The following is transcript of the initial interview conducted with SCP-7077-1. Interviewed. SCP-7077-1 Interviewer Dr. Axel Rivas Forward The meeting took place in Lunar Site 10. Note SCP-7077-1's native language was translated into English after every sentence and vice versa for communication ease. Hello, SCP-7077-1. We appreciate your cooperation and willingness to meet with the Foundation. No issue, Doctor. My first question, how do you end up at the South Pole of Saturn? I've been looking for a stable living place for a while. Not many galaxies offer one. I've checked out this red planet, but a large building was there. Some droids made it clear to me that I was not welcome. I like the weather on the red planet, but it was cold. I see you were able to securely stay within the atmosphere of Mars, the red planet, and you can do so on the moon. How were you able to do so on Saturn, a planet made of gas? I have never had issues with the stability of my stay with a planet's atmosphere. Good to know. Do you know anything about the hexagonal cloud above the southern pole of Saturn? I do, yes. What do you know about it? It appeared when I began to brew my no English word compatible. Come again? <sighs> you foreigners, it is a beverage. I prefer mine cold with no flavor. Most look upon with scorn in these settings. They said flavorless, no English word compatible is distasteful. I say they are distasteful. 
What I'm getting is you brewed a beverage yourself out of something and... Among your eyes. Right. It seems the brew got caught up in a vortex in the southern pole of Saturn, and thus creating a hexagonal cloud. I guess that makes sense, Doctor. Yes, would you mind taking residence on the Earth's moon under the hands of the Foundation? Can I have my beverage with me? We'll see. One last question, Doctor. Ask away. I've heard that you Earth ones. I think you're an Earth one, that build and all can only breathe in Earth. How come you are on the moon, breathing perfectly fine? I was affected by an anomaly. I actually cannot breathe on Earth. Oh, how unfortunate. You must have had to leave your family behind. I locked my family to a black hole. That's terrible. I'm very sorry. It appears we're both long space wanderers. It does. End log. Closing statement. SCP-7077-1 was taken into Foundation custody following the interview with no incident. As of the 2nd of October, 1986, Dr. Beavers had been banned from working with SCP-7077 indefinitely due to a growing emotional attachment. Name, Dr. Axel Rivas. Security clearance level, level 4. Location, Lunar Site 4. Profession, Astrologist, Astrobiologist. Specialties, Astrobiology, Geology, Selenography. Working with Technology, Mathematics, or of the Lunar Sites. History, Dr. Vivas was affected by SCP-7393 on September 4th, 1979, rendering him unable to breathe the Earth's atmosphere, replacing it with the necessity to breathe the Moon's exosphere, thus refining him to live and work within the Foundation's lunar sites. SCP Work SCP-8999 SCP-6009 SCP-7379, SCP-7077, SCP-8002, Log of Anomalous Space Items. Interview Excerpt Forward. The following is an excerpt from an interview between Dr. Vivas and Dr. Cassidy six months following Dr. Vivas's incident with SCP-7379. Begin Log. Did medical staff have to intervene? Do you ever come close to death? And do you know why SCP-7379 affected you? Eh, <sighs> at first, I just passed it off as I was coming down with a bug. I'd just been in space, it made sense, but soon breathing became difficult. And the more oxygen they put me on, the weaker I become. After some tests, it was discovered the water in my body was now like moon water. Plus, I saw the freaking space beetle, or whatever SCP-7379-A is in my dreams before the tests. I told them my hypothesis. We just did the test to make sure. Dr. Beavis' coughs, followed by a shrug. I was probably infected because I stepped in the next river of testing with SCP-8999. Hey, at least I'm a caretaker now, because of our similar conditions. She's a sweet dog. Oh, right. Have there been any physical side effects? Well, I can't spend too long indoors within the oxygen-supplied rooms without getting deathly sick. I've been forced to become an outdoors guy. Well, I can go within the rooms without the oxygen filters. That's unfortunate. <laughs> At least I have an excuse to spend some time with Lucy. Have there been any mental side effects from living in space in a completely different environment compared to where you grew up? Not that I've noticed. One thing that has been brought to our attention is your distant attitude when working with any other Foundation personnel. People go down back to Earth not to return for a while, sometimes ever. It doesn't feel worth my time to invest myself emotionally. So, maybe there is that. But my animals make up for it. 
You don't make friends or get to know your colleagues at the very least because you don't want to get emotionally attached to someone you'll never see again. <laughs> right to the point, I see. If I will never see someone again, why should I befriend them? Why should I waste time mourning over the lost friendships when I could just prevent them entirely? Sure, I want to make friends. Hell, a girlfriend would be nice. But I'm not going to waste my time. What, what if I bother them? What if I trap them on the moon as well? I won't be lonely. But they'll be trapped from their loved ones. Dr. Viva's sighs begins to gently rock back and forth in his seat. So, it isn't that you lack the desire to make friends or maintain relationships. It's that you want to avoid being hurt. That's fear, isn't it? Dr. Vivas, it isn't possible for you to trap anyone else on the moon. That isn't discovered effect of SCP-7379. You can never be too careful. I presume you have family on Earth. Don't you miss them? I did miss them, but it hurt too much to try and hold on. During the first days of my infection, I tried to gain communication with them, but it proved too difficult. Too much effort. I was good friends with Dr. Pearls as well, but it's unlikely I will ever see him again. So you're actively putting in the effort to not miss your loved ones. I'm not sure if that's how I phrase it. Occasionally, I'll get a twinge of pain reminding me of them, and... Dr. Reeves begins to adjust the folders on the table. It reminds me that I'll be here forever, alone. Well, almost alone. And ever these feelings overwhelm me, I'll visit my animals. Hell, maybe I'll sign up to care for a new one. They remind me that everything is going to be alright. I see. Your stress about living on a moon causes you to avoid people in the hopes of never getting attached because you know you'll never see them again. And to make up for this, you care for moon anomalies. I'd say that's about right. <sighs> I don't want to be alone forever. So I try to distract myself from that reality. End log. Addendum 1, Animal List. Below is a portion of the list of the 15 current anomalous animals lacking SCP classification Dr. Reefus is the head caretaker for. A small deer mouse found in the plainest crater of the moon. Deceased, see Addendum 2. An Adelaide penguin found on Saturn's moon rear. A polar bear found at Lunar Site 18. All tests attempting to weigh the animal have determined that it is massless. A currently unknown memetic agent is speculated to be the cause of these results as the animal is affected by lunar gravity. In Okabe, that transports to the sinus and rhythm on the moon when frightened. No breathing issues have occurred. A cow made of moon rock. Addendum 2. Death of the plainest crater mouse. On October 9th, 1987, the anomalous item classified as a plainest crater mouse passed away due to natural causes. Dr. Reavers had personally discovered the mouse and was greatly affected by its passing. The following is an excerpt from the therapy session Dr. Reavers attended the same week. Interviewed Dr. Reavers, interviewer Dr. Childs. Forward. Blank. Begin log. Regarding the death of the plainest cradle mouse, I've heard you were very devastated by its passing. <sighs> Sylvia, yeah. I should have known. She was just a mouse when it came to what God decided. This is why we look for emotional strength in all our employees. I'm sorry for your loss, but luckily you have many other anomalies that will be here for you in its absence. Yeah, I guess. I just... It's not fair. I've lost everyone. Lost everyone? Please explain. 
I could have got my alarm in the leak, and all I was doing was testing Lucy. I can't, I can't see 7077 anymore because I was deemed too attached. And now Sylvia dies, and due to old age, there's nothing I could have done differently to stop this. Dr. Reefer sighs. He puts his face in his hands and proceeds to run his hands through his hair. Even the ones who can't leave the moon still leave me. I'm very sorry. I should have been able to stop this. Would Silver be mad at me? Dr. Reavis taps the table with his thumb and forefinger in a series of two five times. Dr. Reavis, relax. Take a deep breath. You're going to be all right. It doesn't feel like it. The amount of people. And it was here for me is slowly dwindling. They all have typical lifespans. I can see it now. Axel, why didn't you save us? I thought we were going to be best friends forever. This doesn't look like forever. I'm sure Sylvia isn't mad at you. It was her time. Dr. Reavis begins to rock back and forth. We'll never know. That's the worst part. Dr. Reavis lays his hand on the table. It's times like these. Question if things will ever be all right. End log. Closing statement. Dr. Childs contacted other specialists who had sessions with Dr. Reavis in the past and discussed the symptoms he noted. Upon the end of the discussion, the group came to the conclusion that Dr. Reavis could possibly be suffering from obsessive-compulsive disorder. Dr. Reavis had been scheduled to meet with Dr. Sheridan on November 1st, 1987, regarding his symptoms.